Math 287, Quest to College. I'm Joe Vasta, and we're going to cover 4.6, Basis and Dimension. So this section is going to kind of tie together 4.4 and 4.5, and what we're going to do differently about this section is we're going to cover all the definitions, theorems, properties first, and then we'll do all the examples after. So definition, a minimum spanning set of a vector space, so we've already talked about what that is, the minimum number of seeds you need to span the vector space. So a minimum spanning set of a vector space is called a basis of that vector space. The plural of basis looks like bases, but it's pronounced bases. So the plural of basis is bases. You've got a vector space called V. You've got a set of seeds, V1 through V5. There's going to be 11 properties that we're going to look at. The first three are right here. Okay, property number one. All bases... Okay, so remember, this right here is a basis. This is a man, minimum, whoops, minimum spanning set. All bases of V, for this example, have exactly five vectors. Okay, so once you have a basis of a vector space, you know all the other bases will have the same number of elements. You can think of R3, for instance. So R3, probably a, a basis for R3 would be I, J, and K. Well, any other basis for R3 has to have exactly three elements. The dimension of the vector space, this one right here that has this basis, is 5. This is a definition. So we kind of already knew that Let's talk about R5 instead of R3. That R5 has dimension 5. Okay? And this could be I, J, K, and then the other one, 0, 0, the V4 could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and V5 could be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So we kind of already knew what dimension was when it comes to Rn or R5. But that is the definition of the dimension. The dimension is the number of elements in a basis. Okay, because we have a minimum spanning set, S has no dead weight. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at some more definitions here. Okay, so remember we have V1 through V5 is a basis of vector space V. It's a minimal spanning set. Okay, that set V1 through V5 is a minimal spanning set, and that's the definition of a basis. But this means that if you add any vectors to S, then the bigger set still is still a spanning set of V. And if you take away any vectors from S, then the smaller set is not a spanning set of V. So like if you've got a basis for R5, okay, which is a minimum spanning set, and you add like three more vectors to it, all you're doing is adding like the color orange or things like orange to it you're still going to have a spanning set. It's not going to be minimal. But if you've got a basis for R5, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and I'm just saying R5, okay, those are like your primary colors. If you want to use that analogy, and you, you take one of those guys out of the basis, then you've lost some information. You've lost a color, and it is not a spanning set of R5 or your vector 
your vector space V. So a basis is a minimal spanning set. A basis is also, your book's not going to say this, but it's a maximal independence set. That means if you take away the vectors from S, provide it, you don't take the last one. You never want to take the last one. You're at a party and there's like cheesecake. There's the last one. Somehow, you're not supposed to take that because that's manners or whatever like that. So don't take the last vector. <laughs> so if you um, take away one of the vectors or some of the vectors from your set, then the smaller set is still an independent set. Okay, so if you have like red, yellow, blue, you take away one of those colors, you still have two colors and none of those colors are dead weight. So if you didn't have any dead weight to begin with in your basis, you take one or two of the guys away, you're still not going to have dead weight. That's what this says. You'll still have an independent set. Now, if you add vectors to S, so let's just say I have those five vectors, then the bigger set is not an independent set. And the rationale behind that is all bases have five vectors in our example. And once you put in a sixth one, it's not going to be a basis anymore. It's not going to be a minimal spanning set. You have just thrown in dead weight. Think of i, j, and k. Okay, so let's go back to R3. You throw in another vector from R3. Well, i, j, and k could already do the job of um, linear combinations to get any vector in R3. So you throw in another random vector like 1, 2, 5. That guy's just dead weight. He really isn't needed. It's kind of like throwing the color orange in when you have red and yellow. So it's a maximal independent set and a minimal spanning set. That's what a basis is. It's where the minimum meets the maximum. And by the way, that's a theme in higher math where the min meets the max. I'm thinking game theory. There's other places where you want to try to find that sweet spot where the minimum and the maximum meet. Okay, so it's a minimal spanning set and a maximal independent set. And remember, our um, set of vectors, so we're, we're going to cover that up just because we want to remind you that this is the set has V1 through V5. We could have made this um, these properties more general. I think I did that one semester and, and people were really, like, confused. And maybe you're still confused now, I don't know. Let's go with property six. Any set of five independent vectors in the vector space V is a basis. Okay. Any set of five vectors that spans V is a basis. Any spanning set of V must contain five vectors or more. Okay, and that's, it comes back to we've got a minimal spanning set. And because we have a maximal independent set, any independent set of vectors must contain five vectors or less. Okay, if T is a subspace of V, so T is a vector space within a vector space, it's a vector space within V, then the dimension of T must be less than or equal to five. And that kind of makes sense. Now all these properties, there's like mathematical proofs behind it, but we're um, not that kind of class this semester. You want to do lots of proofs and things like that, you go off to the university. If T is a subspace of V, so we already know its dimension is less than or equal to 5, then any basis 
for t is part of a basis for v. And we're going to be using that when we do some examples. So that is the deal. So for S to be a basis, no, for this case it has five vectors, it, ha it must have enough vectors to span V, but not too many that one can be written as a linear combination of the others. And so that's the deal. We don't want dead weight. Once we get more than five vectors, we end up getting dead weight. Okay, so those are 11 properties. Of course, you, <laughs> you we're missing some because you can't fit it all in the camera. 11 properties of bases. And we kind of already knew what a basis was. It's a minimal spanning set. It's a set that does not have dead weight, which makes it independent. It's also a set that if you take all linear combinations, you can get to any vector in your vector space V. So you don't have to memorize all 11 of these properties word for word. You're going to actually see these properties come out as you do homework. Okay? So the homework is not like, hey, write down all 11 properties. It's doing something else. Okay, let's continue with our definitions and our theorems and properties and examples. And so we know what a basis is. Minimal spanning set. Okay, the next page. If a vector space V has a basis consisting of a finite number of vectors, then V is called a finite dimensional vector space. And a lot of the examples that we work with are finite dimensional vector spaces, the ones that we work with in this class so far, like M2, the set of two by two matrices, or P3, the set of polynomials of degree three or less. Otherwise, if it's not finite dimensional, then your vector space is called infinite dimensional. And that would be like the set of all continuous functions on the interval negative infinity to infinity. So that one we're not as comfortable with. But it's also called an infinite dimensional vector space because um, a basis for that would have infinite, dim infinite um, elements in it. We don't want to think about that. We want to think about these ones now for this section. So now what I'm going to do is have a list. And here is our list. I'm going to um, name some standard bases. Well, first some vector spaces that are pretty standard that we'll see in here. And then we'll, we'll do a standard basis. Okay, because we have vectors. There's, there's lots of different bases that you can choose for R2. Okay. A standard basis would be this one. 1, 0, and 0, 1. And those guys have names. They're called i and j. Okay. The dimension of R2 is 2. Wow, it took us um, many minutes of lecture to get there. Um, we kind of already knew that. Now, here's the deal. i and j, you know, your physics teacher really loves to use those. They have other um, names. It would be called vector E1 and vector E2. Now you might say, well, why, Joe? Why? Why can't we just call them I and J? You can, but they have other names. It's like maybe you know someone named Bob, and you found out, oh, well, his official name is Robert. Well, <laughs> there it is. There's Robert and Thomas or whatever. I don't know. Okay. There's a reason math people do this and physics people do the I and J. Because physics people, when they're looking at R3, which they look at it a lot, then they'll use I, J, and K. And in the world of physics, it's probably good enough. We don't need to go on the higher dimensions. But mathematicians, they like to go on the higher dimensions. Sometimes we can be working in R7. Sometimes we can be working in R20. And you might be going, well, that Joe, that's pretty stupid. We don't even know what R4 looks like. And you're saying that you can work in R20? Yes, we can. Um, when I did cryptography, sometimes we would consider R20 or even higher dimensional vector spaces. 
and we're not actually visiting those vector spaces physically, but we're using the algebra from those vector spaces to get real life problems done. So our n, its standard basis is e1, e2, yada, 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 up to en. And that's why sometimes mathematicians, even though we'll use i and j from time to time, but if we're in a higher dimensional vector space, you run out of i, j, k, l, whatever. I mean, what if your vector space is r27? Then you're in trouble. So this makes more sense, where e1 is the vector 1, comma, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0, all the way down the line to whatever dimension you are. And then E2 is 0, comma, 1, comma, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0, and, and all the way down the line. So this little index tells you where the 1 is. Okay. So what's the dimension of Rn? Well, if you count these elements, and it's kind of hard to count because there's a dot, dot, dot there, but you can imagine that there are n of them, and that's the dimension of Rn. Okay, let's go to some other vector spaces that we might feel a little more uncomfortable with. P3. Polynomials of degree 3 or less. Here's your standard basis, your standard building blocks for P3. 1, x, x squared, x cubed. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Joe, how, why? How does that get to everything in P3, polynomials of degree 3 or less? Think of linear combinations. You know, constant times this, plus a constant times this, plus a constant times this, plus a constant times this, could get you any vector that's in P3. Just like a constant times i plus a constant times j can get you anywhere in R2. So. There's a standard basis. Now there are other bases for P3, but this is the one that I always run to if, if they give me a choice. Now here's the confusing part. Well, it's not that confusing, but it's just inconvenient. How many um, vectors in this basis? Well, one, two, three, four. So the dimension of P3 is four. Dimension of Pn is n plus 1. Okay, so we gotta take special note on that and not get confused. Why? Because, I mean, you kind of are counting this is your 1, your x, your x squared up to x to the n, but we're counting that 1 too because this is x to the 1 and so this is like x to the 0 and so there's n plus 1 of them there. Okay, so it's always one number higher than this index in terms of what is the dimension. Okay, so kind of like we went general here on problem number four. You know, we kind of generalized it on problem number two, and we'll do the same thing with problem six. So M2, R. Now your book sometimes says PNR and P3R. Lots of times, you know, sometimes you might see me leave that off. Um, that's there in spirit, it just means your polynomials have real coefficients, and then somehow on these ones I, I put the R back in there. Um, well, that's all right. It just means the entries of the matrix matrices have real elements. So M2, so lots of times you'll just hear me call it M2. It's a set of all two by two matrices. Its standard basis is this right here. These four elements. If you take linear combination of these four elements, you get anything that's an M2. You get any two by two matrix. And look at this, you have one, zero, zero, zero. Kind of reminds you of, you know, the, these elements here. Like if you were in R4, you'd get one, zero, zero, zero. So this would be R4, and then 0, 1, 0, 0. Look at this, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 0, 0, 1, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 1. So it kind of reminds you of that. And so these matrices here have notation. And wherever the 1 is, we describe that with the subscript. The 1 is in the first row, first column. So this matrix here is called E11. And because the one here is in the first row, second column, we call this E12, and so on. 
So that's what it is. Now we didn't have any room because on all these definition sheets which you have on the website, I had to make the font bigger so the camera, you know, so it would show up on the video. So what happens, what's the dimension of M2? I had to put it underneath. It's four, because there's four elements there. Okay. Now consider M by N matrices. Well, I'm not going to write them all down, just like I didn't write all these down. I put dot, dot, dot here. And I'm actually going to be a little more clever with number six than I was with four or two. This basis for M by N matrices is E, I, J. It's kind of like listing all those. Where I is between 1 and M inclusively. And J is between 1 and N inclusively. Because that's a lot of matrices. If you feel uncomfortable with this, then maybe you can write M two by four and then list them all out and you'll see, oh, and you will get this as well, that the number in this basis happens to be M times N. And maybe it kind of makes sense because you just keep moving that one. It's in the um, first row, first column, and then it's in the first row, second column, and you move that one all the way through the matrix, um, putting zeros everywhere else, you're gonna hit the number of elements that would be in a typical matrix like this. And so these are the standard bases. We will see them as we do some homework problems. Now let's go ahead and continue. And like I said, the first part of this lecture is a really weird because I'm doing all the definitions, examples, you know, like we just did an example. But they were really definitions of standard bases and theorems all first and then um, we're gonna then do some writing and do some examples. Theorem. If the dimension of your vector space is n and s is a set of vectors then the following statements are equivalent. Okay so s is a basis and that's going to be equivalent to s is linearly independent and S spans V. Okay, so what does this mean? This means in your homework they're going to say is S a basis? So if you can count <coughs> I think yeah, if you can count your vectors, then you're going to be in good, good shape here. And really, I mean, let me take out a red pen. I think what I want to write in here, S is a set of N vectors. Okay. I don't think we need that, but I'm going to put that. So S is a set of N vectors and the following statements are equivalent. Okay. Theorem. If V is a vector space with basis B, okay, so now you've got a basis, then every vector in V can be written uniquely as a linear combination of the vectors in B. So if you've got a basis <clears throat> and you're using that basis to write linear combination of a vector that is not in the basis, there's only one way of doing that. And that's good because we've seen some examples where, well, it wasn't a basis, but we, we had a set of seeds and it was found that we can write another vector that wasn't in that set infinitely many different ways. So you can look back on one of those lectures and see that we did that. Okay, so that was a lot of theorems and definitions. And now, the rest of this lecture is me working out examples, examples the kinds that you would see in your homework. So in your homework they start off with problems like this. Is the S, <laughs> is the S, wonderful, a basis of V. Okay, so we don't need 
is V. Boy, I'm on a roll today here. This whiteout is weird, but okay. Is S. <laughs> is S a basis of V? Okay, so look at our vector space. It's R3. Okay. Any, ba any basis in R3 must have how many elements? Well, first of all, let's, let's pick out the dimension here. The dimension is 3. Therefore, any basis must have 3 elements. How many elements do we see here? 4. So S has 4 elements. And if it was a basis, it would only have three. So is S a basis of V? And the answer is no. So there are some of your problems in your homework where all you have to do is count the number of seeds and go, oh, it doesn't match with the dimension. Game over. Let's go ahead and do another one. That was pretty simple. For all those complicated definitions and theorems, I mean, you're just like, wow, we could have just not done those. But there, there's a good theory there. V is the S. <laughs> oh, okay, get rid of the. Okay. Is S a basis of V? So V is B2. Polynomials of degree 2 or less. What is the dimension of that? The dimension of P2 is 3. Okay, look at S. It's a set of seeds. How many elements do we see in set S? 1, 2, 3. So S has three elements. Okay. So we can't answer the question yet. Some of you are like, well, just say yes. Well, just because it has three elements, it may have some dead weight in there. So we go back to that other theorem that says, okay, so you've got a set of vectors and you, you want to verify it's a basis, you can do any of the other things. So what I'm going to do, because it's the simplest for me, is check to see if those guys are independent. So it all goes back to the last section where I um, write up linear combinations of these. So this is C1 X plus 1 plus C2, X squared plus 1, plus C3, X squared plus X plus 1. What happened to that X? I don't know. There, okay. Plus 1. This equals the zero vector of P2. The zero vector of P2 is 0. So this is C1x plus C1 plus C2x squared plus C2 plus C3x squared plus C3x plus C3 equals 0. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and circle all the terms that have x squareds in them. Now some of you are saying to yourself, well, this looks like stuff we've done in earlier lectures. Exactly. So that's what might make your homework in 4.6 a little less challenging than 4.4 and 4.5. So once you've figured out 4.4 and 4.5, you're kind of doing the same thing. 
So the blue gives me this first equation, which says C2 plus C3 equals zero. I'll circle all the x terms. Notice I put some zeros on the um, right hand side as I was talking. And so the orange equation is gotten from the coefficients C1 plus C3 equals zero. Let's pick, not that we need another color, I think we get this without the color, but some of you want to see everything circled in color, so that's what I'm doing here. So this one gives me C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals zero. I'm going to go ahead and throw this into an augmented matrix. Zero, one, one, zero. First row is the first equation. One, zero, one, zero. One, 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 zero. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what are we doing, Joe? I forgot. We're checking to see if these guys are independent. If they are, with all the theory that we read, if you have an independent set of three vectors, then that independent set, because the dimension is three, will be a basis. Okay, so you do some row operations. I'm gonna um, do those row operations for you because, you know, I think we've done enough in lecture where you understand row operations, and so I got that. And zero one zero zero for the second row, and then zero zero one zero for the third row. Let's remember what our variables are: C one, C two, C three. And look what this is. And I know I've already used the color orange, but I really like to use it for my pivots. I've got three pivots, so C one is bound. C2 is bound, C3 is bound, which would mean if you went to finish solving this equation, you'd end up getting all of them equals zero. And since they all equal zero, S is independent and because it has three elements and the dimension of the vector space is three, we can say yes to the question, is the S a basis of V? Yes, S is a basis. Okay, we could just say yes. And so it all came down to <laughs> verifying whether that set here was independent. Now had there only been two vectors in this problem, then we would have right away said no. Or if there had been like five vectors, then we would have said no, there would have to be three. Now was it possible that they gave us three and we end up doing this and we find out that <clears throat> one of these um, variables is free and then the answer is no? Yeah, it was possible that one of these guys could have been dead weight. But not on this example. I mean, on this example, we ended up getting, there was no dead weight. This is an efficient machine. So we have an efficient machine, a minimal spanning set, a maximal independent set. It's a basis. Okay. So that completes problem number two. Let's look at Problem number three. And I did it again. See, it propagates because I was just doing cut and paste. Is the S. Okay.
is S a basis of vector space V. Okay, so vector space V here is two by two matrices. The dimension of that happens to be four. Okay, that's the two by two matrices. Now look at our set of seeds they give us. One, two, three. Look. S has three elements. Doesn't have enough elements for it to span this vector space. So the answer is S a basis of V. The answer is no. So that's how you do your homework. I think the first thing you should do is count the elements. And for some of your problems, you'll be done really quickly. Now, if you have this, if you had four elements, then I would check to see if those four elements were independent. Check to see if there's any dead weight and go from there. If there is dead weight, then the answer is no. And if there is not dead weight, meaning they're all bound, then the answer is yes, like the last one. But that's only if there were four elements. Okay. Let's do the next one. Okay, find null space. Basis of null space, I forgot to put a bracket in here. This is nice. And dimension of the null space. Okay, so basis, dimension, and null space. So they ask you problems like this in your book. And so how do I find the null space? Once again, what the null space is, is you consider this, AX equals the zero vector. The null space is all the solutions to this. And so what I've got to do is write the augmented matrix, add the right hand side vector, which is just going to be zero, zero. So that's what I'm going to do. So notice, we do see a new word, basis, okay? Because we've just learned that's a minimal, minimal spanning set. Um, but most of this problem will, will just be a review of stuff we've done in the past. The next thing we're gonna do is reduce this matrix to row echelon form. It's already there, look at this. There's a leading one there and a leading one there. In fact, it's in reduced row echelon form. I'm going to go ahead and call my variables. Well, I have five variables, so I'm not going to go X, Y, Z, W, etc. I'm going to go X1, X2, X3, X4, and X5. So it looks like X1 is bound, X2 is free, and then X3 is bound, X4 is free, and X5 is free. Okay, so x5, I'm going to set that equal to a parameter, t, and x4, the same thing, uh, but not t, but I'm going to set it equal to a parameter. That's what I meant by same thing. So I'll set it equal to s, and then look at x3. Look at this equation here. So this, it says x3 equals zero. X2 is free, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm walking backwards through the alphabet. T, S, R, and then we have those guys right there. Okay, the top equation says X1 minus x4 minus, there's x4, 
which is s. This equals 0, so x1 equals s. Okay, so my null space, this is not going to be my final answer, but it looks like this. s comma r comma 0 comma s comma t. s rust, whatever that means. Okay, common mistake people do is they do this on the exam and then they list them in the other order. So don't do that, okay, because you're supposed to put x1 first. This, was, would it be something I did when I was taking linear algebra? I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, yeah, I will. It would have been something I did. So the next thing I want to do is splactor. Okay. So when I splactor this, it's going to splactor into a linear combination of how many elements? Well, there are three different parameters there, so it's going to be three elements. So watch this. Um, I will go ahead and put the R here. So this is going to be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus and then we'll go with S, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, plus T, and this is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, or another way of saying that is E5, and then this is E2, and this one is, it is what it is. I mean, you could say E1 plus E4. But let's not do that. Okay, so let's answer. There's three questions it wants me to do. It wants me to find the null space, the basis of the null space, and the dimension of the null space. And we probably already know what the dimension is. Look, we have just written any element of the null space can be written as a linear combination of these three seeds. Okay, so notice I said three seeds. That's the dimension. Let's just go ahead and write them in order. The null space of A is really this. So we could actually put the set notation and write that, or even write that, and then put such that R, S, and T are elements of the real number. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the null space is really because isn't this what it is? This is the span of these three vectors. Watch this. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. We have 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then we have good old E5 over here. So that is what the null space is. We like this notation because we can see all the building blocks. So these are the building blocks and you span them, you get the whole null space. So the next question they ask is what is a basis for the null space of A? Well, the basis would just be what you see in these braces here. And there's only three of those things in the basis. So I know we're writing the same thing a lot. But we really want to make sure we know how to do these problems when we get to our homework. And so there's a basis. <clears throat> on the null space. Okay, so look. How many elements are in the basis? Three elements. How many elements are in the null space? Well, some of you might want to say three because you see three things here, but it's the span of those, so infinitely many elements. Let's answer our last question, which is the dimension. And I'm running out of space, so I'm going to get a little lazy here null space A. 
and that happens to be 3. So in your homework when they ask a question like this, this is how you do the problem. Okay, so we have, I think, three more problems left. Let's go ahead and take a look at them. I'm curious to see what time it is. So we're like at 45 minutes. Okay, so we um, are asked in the last three problems that I'm going to do, we're asked to find five things. Okay, so first of all, what do we have? They give us a vector space and they give us set S, which looks like a set in the vector space. Now, because they're asking us to find the dimension of S and basis of S, S is actually a subspace. Okay. Now I'm using the book's notation where I'm just calling everything S now because that's how they'll be doing it in your homework. So you have a vector space, P3. You have a subspace of that vector space, so a vector space within the vector space. We're calling it S in these examples. Okay. And there's the description. They want us to find a basis for V, the dimension of V a basis for S and the dimension of S. And then E, how convenient because this starts with an E, extend basis of S to get a basis for V. So because S is a subspace of V, the dimension of S is going to be less than, it could be equal to, but less than or equal to the dimension of V. So let a and B are going to be pretty simple for a lot of the problems, okay? Because, look, A it says find a basis of, of P3. Well, we'll just use the standard basis. P3 is polynomials of degree 3 or less. So for part A, a basis would be this. Um, 1 x x squared x cubed. So there's part A. Part B, it asked me to find the dimension of P3. Well, there are four elements in the basis, so the dimension is 4. Dimension of P3 will always be 4. Okay. Part C. On part C, they ask me to um, find a basis for S. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated. What am I going to do? Let's just write out what an element of S looks like. Okay, so there is an element of S. Now, obviously, um, vectors in S are also vectors in P3. So the thing that I want to do with this is like what I did in the last problem when I was um, finding the null, null sp space. Can't talk today. It's, I'm going to come up with an excuse. It's the smoke. I'm looking outside the window. It looks like a foggy day, but it smells like smoke, and I don't know. feels like I've already had like three packs, and it's, it's in the morning already, and that was just me walking to my car, coming here. Okay, splactor. I'm going to splactor this. Now, what does that mean? Split and factor? So I'm going to split it into A's, B's, and C's. Those are the, the three different letters I see, not including the X's. So look at this. Here's A. So I have an X cubed. And what else do I have? I have a plus one. Plus B. Okay, I have 
x squared. Any other v's? Oh, plus 1. And then plus c, and then what do I have? I have 1. So look, I've just splattered the general element, or any general element, in um, subspace S into something like this, which looks like something that starts with an L. This is a linear combination of three seeds. Really, I should be calling them vectors or elements, but oh well. So what we have is any element in um, subspace S can be written like this as a linear combination of these three polynomials, these three vectors. So when they're asking to find a basis for S, a basis for S happens to be those three polynomials, those three vectors. So we have x cubed plus 1, x squared plus 1, and 1. Yes, 1 is a polynomial of degree 3 or less. So there it is. Part D. What is the dimension of S? Well, a basis of S looks like this, and it has three elements, so the dimension of S is also three. Okay, part E for extend. So extend means you take this basis, which has three elements, and you add to it to get a basis for P3. That's what you want to do. So, for this answer, that's what extend a basis means. Extending a set means adding to the set. Okay, so we don't know what we, we're going to do yet, but once we do a few of these problems, you'll go, oh, this isn't so bad. This has three elements in it, and any basis for P3 has four elements. So how many more elements does this need? It only needs one more element. So here's the part where you really want to listen to. When extending a basis, it's a good rule of thumb to always consider adding one of your basic building blocks from your standard basis of the big vector space. Okay, so I'm looking at this, 1x, x squared, x cubed. Sometimes it's going to seem like all you do is eeny, meeny, miny, mo. you close your eyes and you pick one. But on this one, I'm telling you, you, you don't want to do that. In fact, on all of them, you want to look and say, well, is something missing? You know, like when I was writing this, was there some kind of polynomials in P3 that are not included in here? And so, you know, look at these vectors closely. 1, x squared plus 1, x cubed plus 1. Is something missing? And you may have to pause the video and think about it for a few minutes. That was kind of weird when I said you might want to pause the video and think about it. Then, of course, my camera shut off. Okay, so the camera's got problems. It shuts off after... 50 some minutes. Well anyway, so hopefully you thought about it. Um, the thing that seems to be missing here is an X. Like you do any linear combination, you, you consider this set, you're never going to get a polynomial that has an X term in it. So probably a good thing to add is the X. And so look, this right here is a basis for V. Look, one, two, three, four. Are bases for um, P3 unique? No, this is your standard one. This is a non-standard one, but this is what we needed to do. We couldn't just write this for the answer for extending the basis because that wouldn't be extending this basis. Extending this basis, you would have to write this basis plus another element. Here's the answer. Now for all you math purists, 
you're like, wait a minute, Joe. Are we sure this is a basis? So if you want to be sure, let's check to make sure it's independent or check to make sure there's no dead weight in there. I'm going to go do that by writing linear combination of those. And set it equal to zero. Well, look, so I have part of that there, and, and they're called A, B, and C, but here I have C1, C2, C3. Okay, so watch this. I'm going to go C1, X cubed, plus C1, plus C2, X squared. This, I'm doing the part in blue just so I can sleep better tonight. You're like, wow, you've, you're, you're mixed up. I am. Okay, I'm going to circle all my terms that have an x cubed in them. I'm not going to put that on the other side. I know that I'm going to set the coefficients equal to zero. And look, that's the only one. So look, c1 is zero. In order for this to be independent, the only solution that, that I should get from here is all the ci's are zero. Okay, another color. I'm going to circle all the x squareds. There's only one there, so look, C2 equals zero. Okay, I'm going to circle all the, oh, <laughs> I messed up here. I, I don't know how to multiply, and I'm your math teacher. It might be too late to switch classes, <laughs> so this is C4x. Okay, I knew something was fishy there. So look, I have C4 equals zero. I'm going to circle the other guys in yellow. And that one gives me C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals zero. But I know from over here that C1 and C2 are zero. So you know what this gives me? C3 is zero. Now, some of you might be saying, Joe, why didn't you just throw this into an augmented matrix? Because that would be killing an ant with a cannon. It would get the job done, but it would leave a mess. All I wanted to do was verify that there was no dead weight, that this was an independent set. And it is, because all the CIs are forced to be zero, which means I can sleep a little safer knowing that. Now, if you had gone eeny, meeny, miny, mo and just put an, an x squared there and you did this, you would end up getting um, infinitely many solutions. You would end up getting a free variable. Okay. So that is how you do these problems where they ask you to find the basis for a vector space and a subspace and the dimensions and extending the basis of the subspace to get the basis, the basis of the, the vector. We're going to do another one that is very similar, same five directions, except now what we're going to do is our vector space is going to be M2. So there it is. Okay. Using the wrong color here. So A. This is M2, this is two by two matrices. What's a basis for the two by two matrices? Well, basis, I'll just use the standard basis. E11, E12, E21, E22. Now, if you want to write them out, you could. You know, this one would be the 2x2 two two matrix that is 1, 0, 0, 0. This one would be 0, 1, 0, 0. And then this would be 0, 0, 1, 0. And this would be 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? Well, that would take more time to write out. Also, note, when they say find a basis for, for V, most of the time, well, all the time, I'm going to pick the standard basis. 
could you pick like one, two, three, four, and then the next one, some other random two by two matrix and just kind of create your own? Yes, the problem is you might end up, especially if you're just randomly picking two by two matrices, you might end up picking a set that is dependent, that has some dead weight. So that's why it's always best to go with your standard basis on this problem here. What's the dimension of M2? The dimension of M2 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. Okay, part C. This is the one where we might have to do a little work to get here, okay? So S is symmetric matrices with trace equals zero. Okay, so what does um, an element from this subspace look like? Well, symmetric matrices trace zero. So am I free to put any number there when I'm coming up with a matrix? Yes, so I'm gonna make that number A. Am I free to put anything here? Yes, and you're like, but it's symmetric, that's all right. Am I free to put anything here? And the answer is no. Because it's symmetric, I have to have the same elements on both sides. Um, the element right here that's in the first row, second column has to be the same as the element that's in the second row, first column. So I have to put a B there. Am I free to put anything there? And the answer is no, because the trace equals zero. The trace is when you add up the main diagonal. That main diagonal has to add up to zero, so I absolutely need a negative A there. So that is what an element, any element from subspace S looks like. Okay, so what do we do with this? We're going to splactor. Split and factor. So I have A. This is 1, 0, 0, negative 1, plus B, 0, 1, 1, 0. What do I have here? I have a linear combination, not that you have to write this down, but I'm just showing you, of two seeds. So anything in subspace S can be written as a linear combination of these two seeds. So when they ask me to find the seeds or a basis for S, it's going to be these guys here. So one, zero, zero, negative one. And then the other one, zero, one, one, zero. So there that is. Let me just make a little note about this guy right here. Zero, one, one, zero. He kind of reminds you of who? He kind of reminds you of the identity, but he is not the identity. I call it the evil identity. And you're like, what? Is that technical? No, it's not. That's just what I like to call it. <laughs> okay, so most other math instructors, instructors would ridicule me for that. They were like, why do you call that the evil identity? Because it's funny. Um, see what happens when you multiply that by a two by two matrix. It's pretty evil. Okay, um, what's the dimension of S? Well, here is a basis for S. So the dimension of S is two. So for part E, you've got to write this down and you're gonna add how many more vectors to this? Well, you're gonna add two more vectors to this to get up to four because that's what you're doing. You're writing um, a basis for V by extending that basis. So let me go ahead and write this down.
Okay, so what to write? What are we going to write here? Well, you're trying to take... We're going to need more paper here. We're trying to take, like, linear combinations of these. And when you do just this set, you're going to get elements where vectors when you do when you do these linear combinations where um, those numbers are always going to be the same so you probably and you want to add I'm going to add one of these guys in there or we're going to I'm going to actually add two of these guys in there and we can do this because of that last theorem or maybe it's one of those theorems we saw where we can extend or maybe it was the, the um, sorry it was, may have been the last property on that long list of properties. So we can do that. We're guaranteed that we can do this. So one of the vectors I want to add happens to be, so I won't have the situation where I always have the same number here. So maybe it should be like E12 or E21. And you know, now I'm just going to pick and I'm going to pick um, E12. And I'm actually going to write it out like this. So I'm going to say, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay. So now that I've thrown this in here and I do linear combinations of this, I should be able to, um, you know, when I use this, make it so I, I don't always have the same number there. Okay. Now, it is very important what you pick next because Okay, so you've already picked this guy right here. Now suppose you did go eeny, meeny, miny, oh, between the other three, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and you just like went out and did that, and then you said, okay, so I'm gonna write the wrong matrix here, and I'm gonna correct it with the whiteout. Suppose you said, oh, well, uh, let's just pick this one here. Well, there's a problem with this. Well, we can run through the whole, let's write this as a linear combination, set it equal to zero, 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 you know, the zero vector, and then find that there's dead weight in here. But you might be able to see that because look what happens when you take that matrix and add it to this matrix. So you have this matrix plus this matrix actually gives you this matrix right here. So we have just written this matrix as a linear combination of these two, which means you've got dead weight in here, so you cannot add that one. So I'm going to put a zero there. You don't want to add the zero vector either. Okay, so that's what it looks like I'm adding. What you want to add to make it so these guys are not always going to be opposites is either E11 or E22. And you're like, well, so I can pick. Yeah, the answer here is not going to be unique. Um, what I'll add is E11. And that should do the job. Now, why do I have another piece of paper here? Is because what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just verify really quickly that these guys um, make up an independent set, therefore a basis. So um, I have C1. 1, 0, 0, negative 1, plus C2. So I'm writing out linear combinations of those. Oh, why did I do that? Okay, come on. This thing, okay, so my whiteout is, is acting up. Okay, I think I fixed it. Oh, it's happening there. Okay, so that is 1. Zero. Okay, so we're back on track here. C3. Zero, one, zero, zero. Plus C4. One, zero, zero, zero. I'm saying that we could have put um, E22 there. Almost didn't have enough room here. Once again, I'll put, I'm setting this equal to the zero vector. Now the advantage of pulling off vectors from your standard basis to um, extend your basis for S is that when you do check to see if these guys are independent, um, you're going to have lots of zeros and you will usually be able to eyeball it.
And what do I mean by that? Let's go ahead and check this. And we'll come back to this page after I'm done with this. So look, if you take the, um, the entry from the top left, you'll end up getting C1 plus C4 equals zero. So that's top left. Top right, you would end up getting, well, there's a zero there. So C2 plus C3 equals zero. Bottom left, you would end up getting zero C2. Let's see. So zero C1 plus C2 and then zero, zero. So C2 equals zero, which is promising. We like that. And then bottom right would be negative C1 zero, 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 zero. Negative C1 equals zero, which means C1 is zero, which would then um, help us with these guys here. So T C2 equals zero gives me C3 equals zero. And then this one gives me C4 equals zero, which shows that it's independent, or another word of another way of thinking about that is there is no dead weight, which is good. No dead weight. It's independent, which means what I wrote down here for answer E is a basis. So let me box my answers. Kind of looks like a big shoe here. That is. Let me put some laces on it. There's, there's my answer. It's boxed up. Boxed up in a like a shoe. Okay. Let's go ahead and do one last example. Okay. So this is the last example we're going to do. Finding all these five things. Bases of the vector space, dimension of the vector space, V. Yeah, that should be simple. And then um, this, this other stuff. So um, vector space is R2. The subspace is just 0, 0. So this is going to be a weird one, but it's one that needs to be done for this class. Okay, what is the basis for R2? Or a basis for R2 would just be I and J. And I'm going to write them as 1, 0, 0, 1. And you can write them as IJ if you want. What is the dimension of our vector space R2? Well, huh, there's two elements there, or maybe you just knew it was two. Okay. So, for C. Basis for S. So what does S look like? S looks like this. And if you take any all the linear combinations of the vectors in S, you know, you put a constant there like r times that, um, you just end up getting 0, 0 each time. So a lot of us might think, well, let's go ahead and just put, um, for the basis, let's just put 0, 0. Well, we can't do that. Because remember, if the 0 vector is in the set, like this set right here, then that set is dependent. <laughs> and a basis has to be independent. So what do we do here? And this is going to probably confuse some of you. Well, we can't include 0, 0 because it's dead weight. So that's dead weight. So you have to cross it out. And when you cross that out, okay, so let's just go like this. Okay, so here's the set with 0, 0. And we know 0, 0 is dead weight. So we just cross it out. What are you left with? You're left with a set containing nothing. This will be the only time this happens, but the basis for subspace S that contains the zero vector is the empty set. So that will only happen when your vector space is the zero vector. I know that upsets people, but it is what it is. Once again, you can't say it's just going to be 0, 0, because 0, 0, that is dead weight. That would be a dependent set. Okay, how many um, elements are in the empty set? Let's count them. <laughs> well, there are none. There are no elements. So, what's the dimension of S? It's 0. 
So let's extend this empty set, okay, because the set has nothing in it. We're going to extend it by adding elements into it so we get a basis for R2. R2. So how many more elements do you have to add to um, something that contains nothing? You have two more elements to add. And usually I pick my elements to be elements, you know, from here. And there's two of them up here, so let's add them. There's the answer. You want to check to see if those are independent? Well, I don't think so. We already know this is a standard basis. So that was our last problem. It was pretty weird. Um, that doesn't usually happen, but I have to, as a math instructor, I have to show you the example where the subspace is the zero vector. It just has to be done. I could lose my job if I don't show you that. So this concludes section 4.6. Do your homework. Have a good day.